Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the Sabbath that's coming and uh, for the time that we can spend in fellowship with you and with those that are, are studying and seeking you. Uh, we're thankful, Lord, for uh, the blessings of this past week and even all the trials and difficulties that arise, that we are our most thankful that you give us this one day in seven in which to completely set all those things aside and to, to feel your presence. We pray for those that are struggling and um, we pray that this Sabbath will be a blessing. We ask Lord that as we open up your word together, as we look at um, a review of, of some of the things that we've been studying and some of the questions that have arisen um, and some of the comments that can be shared. We just ask Lord that um, this will be a powerful uh, study and that we will, we will be strengthened by it. So we invite your Holy Spirit's presence and we thank you for all the things that you do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> Now, um, the, I, I sent some, some papers, uh, three PDFs, uh, which we're going to uh, look at a little bit. And, and they're a bit more detail of, of what we have been studying in that there, there are still some details that haven't been completely worked out um, that I'm still trying to uh, to understand or to have confirmation on. Um, now, there was a book which I mentioned, and it must be on one of my old computers, so I have to go dig them up. Um, because I, I found Samuel Snow's later book from 18, 1863, which is kind of interesting, the date, um, uh, about Elias the prophet. You know, he thought he was Elijah the prophet. And, uh, but there was another book that he had written, which contains a lot of correspondence that he had with others uh, shortly after um, 1844. And, and I believe it's in his book called, uh, uh, oh, what's it called? Uh, I can't think of the name of the book. Um, but anyway, it's in this other book where he puts together uh, his, his scenario or his story about how he's being mistreated and, and so forth. So it, it's kind of an interesting, uh, you can see into his character a lot in that book, but I just don't have it and I can't find it online. And so I, and I don't even remember when I, um, when I originally downloaded it but I did read it, and so it was a very fascinating book. But I, I did put his other book here, The Voice of Elias. And um, then I have two other doc documents, so I'll, I'll bring them up here on the screen. Uh, so uh, this one here, which is, is quite interesting, uh, interesting read in that it covers a lot of the things that we've talked about. Um, from, you know, the history of the Midnight Cry. Uh, lest we forget, this is the Adventist Pioneer Library from the second quarter in 1993. Now, um, the second quarter of 1993, uh, in that second quarter, in that history, so January, February, March is the first quarter. In April, that's when Waco occurred. So in April of 1993, uh, April 19th specifically is when Waco burned to the ground and it had been going on since uh, February 28th was when the siege began. Um, so I just didn't find it interesting that it's in that history uh, which is a an echo of our history to some degree that uh, we have this uh, publication and um, so we're just going to start reading some of this The camp meeting at Exeter, New Hampshire, 
lacked inspiration, depth, spirit. Elder Joseph Bates was preaching on the third day, August 15, 1844, reviewing the great lines of prophecy which proved Christ's second coming was at the door. Now, this is an interesting uh, statement uh, because we had taken the position that it's, that it's on the third day of the meetings that uh, Samuel Snow comes and Joseph Bates is preaching. And we had placed that on, on the 14th. And then we had on the 15th that Samuel Snow then presented, did three presentations. Now, this author here says that it was August 15th was the third day. Well, the camp meeting began on August 12th. And, and we get that information from, uh, 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 Froome in uh, Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers, Volume 4. And in here, um, he says, on August 12, 1844, a five-day camp meeting opened in Exeter, New Hampshire. Now, there could be some, some uh, discrepancy as far as how somebody counts. So when you say the third day of the camp meeting, we would normally say, well, the 12th, the 13th, the 14th. So the 14th is the third day, and that's how we've interpreted it. Here he's interpreting the third day as being the 15th. Now, it could be just an error in thinking on his part, but it could be that camp meetings in opening on August 12th is just an opening meeting, you know, in the evening, which we've often have, or, you know, people all get there on that day, and then, you know, really the next day is the first day of the camp meeting, and that would be the first day of meetings, and the second and the third day. So I don't know, I, I want to try to look into this further to see if I can uh, uh, discern that, but that, that would be quite a bit different view. If it's still, we're still marking the first day of the fifth month, it's still August 15th, but uh, one of the problems, and, and I was trying to look for a document that I had done uh, back in August of 2014. So we had a camp meeting in Alberta here um, where Jeff, not in the meetings, because he was presenting on the progressive destruction of four, the number four, and that's where he presented um, Manasseh, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah as fulfillments of Leviticus 26. And, um, and I had also presented at that camp meeting the same thing, just a bit more from a chronological point of view and the connection to the 70 years captivities, the different periods of 70 years and 140 years and so forth. I hadn't actually worked out all the details at that time in 2014, but I was just starting on that. And, um, but just in between some of the meetings, he asked this question, about the first day of the first month. So that's because Emiliano had been there in Arkansas in 2014. That's the time he got sick. Um, and uh, so Emiliano had, had brought up this first day of the first month and the first day of the fifth month. And so Jeff had asked, and in that meeting, you know, Jeff had been counting this period of 120 days and, and 70 days. Um, and then I, explained to him that the Jewish calendar didn't really have 30 days a month. It's 30, 29, 30, 29, which he had never heard. And it wasn't until uh, the next year in the summer in the camp meeting they had in Arkansas in June, started June 22nd in 2015 um, or 2004. Let me think here. So I'm getting this wrong. It was in 2013 that I wrote this paper because that was the year I got married. So that's how I remember and it was in 2014 that they presented it at the camp meeting. So Emiliano actually found this in 2013. Uh, and so I'm giving you some background history for some people who are watching this may not know, but Jeff started in 2012 doing a series on Habakkuk's tables. Um, and that series uh, stopped for a little while and then started and finished in the spring. And some of the times he would have different speakers come and speak. So he, he, he had these studies in Arkansas. And Emiliano came to speak and present this, but he was too sick. So, um, so that was in 2013. So in 2014 is when it was 
nailed down uh, by Noel that it that the first day of the first month was August 15th in 1844. And I'd done a study on this as well, um, which I had written in 2013. So that's why I couldn't find it. I was looking at documents written in 2014. So I got my, my year mixed up. So, um, so I should be able to find it somewhere. Anyway, we know that, uh, that uh, you, it, it took us a while to dig this up, to sort of sort through the calendars um, and understand August 15th, and that we marked that as the first day of the fifth month. And, and so it was Noel who'd done that in 2014. And, and we didn't find out about Midnight or Boston. So we had the Exeter camp meeting, but the Boston sermon where it was midnight and he first gave the midnight cry uh, at midnight, uh, that we didn't find out until a couple of years later. So that was uh, in, in 2015, actually, I believe uh, that that was discovered and we tried to deal with it in 2016. So we tried to sort through that. So that's just a little bit of background information. Uh, so it's interesting here in this document. Um, so I, I have here, uh, I'm gonna share this here. I'm just gonna bring it up. Um, I guess I'll go there, that's easier. <clears throat> so this is um, the E.G. White disc and it has Froome's uh, Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers, volume four. And so he's telling the story of what happened. Now in this document, he doesn't talk about which day it was. And I can't remember where we found that it was the third day. I, I think it might be Bates himself who says it was the third day. Um, but it's just interesting here. You can see on August 12, 1844, a five-day camp meeting opened in Exeter, at Exeter, New Hampshire, a few miles from East Kingston, scene of the first Millerite camp meeting in the United States just two years prior. Um, so different ones came anticipating new light. And it was here that a new concept indeed and a new conviction began to grip the Millerites, which changed their attitude from, from lassitude and indefinite waiting to intense expectancy. So, so we know it was at this camp meeting uh, that this happened, but it's just the timing of this. And, and you'll, you'll see that the story is sometimes told in different ways by different writers. Some of the details are different. Um, like who was there and who said different things, um, you know, exactly in, in, in how it was. But this, this is pretty much the story that we know. Suddenly a man rode up to the camp on horseback while Bates is preaching. It was Samuel Sheffield Snow dismounting. He came and sat down by the side of his sister, Mrs. John Couch, wife of one of the Adventist preachers, who was seated at the edge of the crowd that filled the large tent. In subdued phrases, he began to rehearse to her his convictions as to the cause of their Lord's delay and set forth persuasively the evidence for the coming of Christ in the autumn of 1844, on the very day of atonement. Her heart was thrilled with the whispered message. Unable to keep silence, she suddenly rose and in a ringing voice addressed Bates, the preacher, Bates, the preacher at, in the desk. It is too late to spend time upon these truths with which we are familiar and which we, which have been blessed to us in the past and have served their purpose in time. So she says, here's a man with a message from God. It was a dramatic moment. So obviously I think, you know, his sister, maybe she hadn't heard what Samuel Snow had taught. Uh, and if anybody knows about his sister, I, I believe that uh, he writes about her or gives testimony about her and also his brother in the influence that they had upon him. So, so the point is, you know, there's some details maybe here that are elaborated on or for dramatic effect. I don't know. But, you know, once he was there, he came up and then presented. So we have always placed that on August 14th. And then he does three presentations the next day. Uh, but this writer here in uh, this magazine, this periodical, um, you know, says it was on August 15th that was the third day. So they're counting the third day um, 
you know, not from the 12th, but from the 13th, 14th, 15th being the third day. So whether, whether it is or not, I don't know. So just uh, an interesting point. Now, he's going to give basically the same account uh, that we just read, um, a little bit shorter, not so elaborate and not so dramatic. Um, now, it says here, in the May 17th, 1844 issue of the Midnight Cry, William Miller had pointed out several Jewish events that suggested the seventh month as a possible time for the advent. So. This was, um, this actually was an article that was written on uh, May 3rd, 1843, but it was published May 17th, 1844 in an issue of the Midnight Cry. So um, when, when they look at it here, the way that they're presenting this, when you look at Bates and how he presents this history, and then you read this article, they tend to ignore uh, the early history of snow presenting. They tend to always focus on Exeter because in, in many people's minds, that's where the midnight cry obviously was empowered. Uh, Bates, on the other hand, um, in his account, he focuses more upon Boston as when the midnight cry was given, as, as does Ellen White saying that it was given midway and Lothborough, when he presents what Snow presented at Boston, he actually places his Boston words at Exeter, um, which, which I've gone through before. So, so there are some details here that obviously that when Adventists are reading this history, they're just seeing that all of a sudden, out of nowhere, really, Snow came up with this revelation, and, and now... You know, he whispers in his sister's ear, tells him, you know, uh, or tells her and that, you know, there's the, all this stuff he just found out. And then she says, Brother Bates, somebody has this truth. You know, we need to hear this. And, and, and that's the way most Adventists think of it. But we, can, we know as we studied it, Samuel Snow's letters and his personal testimony on December 31st, 1843, uh, that he already had studied this out based on what had happened in the fall of 1843, that Miller had suggested Christ would come back in the fall in the, using the fall types, the fall feasts. And so, so this really had been developing um, all through this history. And, and, I, and I've thought about it, you know, quite a bit when it comes to the Sunday law that, you know, many Adventists just think the Sunday law is all of a sudden just going to pop, pop up out of nowhere. And, you know, we wake up one morning and it says, you know, there's this Sunday law and, and, and then we just have to keep, you know, the Sabbath and, and not keep Sunday or whatever. Um, but we can see there's always these developments or these progressions. And even when it comes to October 22nd, 1844, as we reviewed this past week, that wasn't the first time that they looked for a shut door that, that, that actually started with August 11th, 1840 which to me was a real revelation uh, to see that. And as we look at this movement, what God has been doing, um, you know, some people have become discouraged over the disappointments of predictions that have been made. But we know in Millerite history that they had continually been disappointed. It wasn't just the first disappointment and the great disappointment. And um, so for us to become discouraged when we see what God has wrought, um, to me, would be a great tragedy uh, to, to give up when God has, has definitely placed his seal and his, his fingerprint, and, and Palmoni has, has definitely put his fingerprint on what we have studied. Now, sure, there's some of the stuff that's been studied and some of the things people have understood that aren't quite correct, um, but that's also similar with Millerite history. There's many ways that, uh, that uh, God leads people. People sometimes have wrong ideas. And so we, we see that in, in uh, Millerite history as well, just as, as we do in our history. So um, I'll just read this paragraph again. In the May 17th, 1844 issue of The Midnight Cry, William Miller had pointed out several 
Jewish events that suggested the seventh month as a possible time for the Advent. Among these events were the atonement and cleansing of the sanctuary. He said that on the Day of Atonement, the tenth day of the seventh month, the high priest entered the inner sanctuary for the work of the atonement. Miller recommended it as worthy of prayerful consideration. Um, so now this is that article. It says it continues on page seven. So I have to move ahead to page seven to finish off uh, this article. I hate when magazines do that. Uh, so perhaps Snow considered this possibility for he wrote a challenging article printed in the Midnight Cry, February 16th, 1844. So one of the things about this guy is he's making some mistakes. So when it comes to his August 15th date, and even um, you know how he's putting it together, he hasn't worked out the details. And so when he says the Midnight Cry published on February 16th, we know it was published on February 22nd, it, the letter was written on February 16th. So the fact that even somebody here writing an Adventist um, history article uh, doesn't have all the details. Now, of course, we're blessed in that we have the internet. Uh, back in 1993, the internet was pretty young, uh, four years young, and, and definitely people were not searching in 1993 and finding all this stuff that we can find now. Um, so, you know, he may have a source that talks about this February 16th letter that's published in the Midnight Cry. He might assume that it was February 16th that was published and, and not realize it was published February 22nd. So, so, you know, we can see there are some details that are wrong here. But the fact is very few Adventists know any of this history. And to show them this history, things like Samuel Snow's letters is a very powerful uh, witness of of this movement that it's uh, guided by God. Um, so in that letter, he says, the Lord had shown me, has shown me that we must wait and suffer a little longer, giving several arguments regarding the dispensation of the fullness of times. He proposed that the termination of the prophetic periods would be in the autumn of AD 1844, rather than in the spring. His first argument was based on the idea of the week of 7,000 years, wherein for each day of the creation week, 1,000 years would correspond to the age of the earth. The last 1,000 years, or Sabbath rest, would be during the millennium. Entire years must be taken into account in events such as the Hebrew captivity, um, B.C. 742, and the breaking of the power of Manasseh, uh, 677, occurred in the autumn rather than in the spring or beginning of the year. Um, so again, it, another wrong date. Uh, the Hebrew captivity didn't begin in 742. That began uh, for northern Israel in 723. And of course, the breaking of the power of Manasseh, the breaking of the pride of power, that is 677. But it's just interesting to see these little errors that people have when they're going through this history, something that we're very familiar with, but even a historian uh, is getting quite a few details wrong. Um, so he says his ba second argument was based upon the 2300 days. Now, one of the things you'll see here, too, um, that when he talks about 677 BC, he doesn't mention the 2520. So one of my arguments that I've had from the beginning is that the 2520 wasn't so much rejected. I mean, it was. There was a prophetic foundation that was rejected. Um, but I don't think people realized that they were rejecting the 2520. That is, they didn't have some official meetings where they discussed the 2520 and decided the 2520 wasn't truth. Um, often people who are opposed to the 2520 try to give it this impression that this was a decision made in 1863 when they made the new chart. Um, and we know that that's wrong. That's not what happened. Nobody was really considering that the chart was like some kind of official statement of what they believed. It was basically just the 1850 chart with the words taken off. So they took the pictures from the 1850 chart, flipped them around. Uh, some of them are reversed. And, um, and then they uh, added some timelines at the top, uh, the 2300 days and the 70 weeks, and then also the week of Christ. So that on the 1863 chart, they then had to write a book or a booklet to explain what's on the chart. 
So they wrote it on a table and wrote it in a book. And Joseph Bates refers to this as the fulfillment of a prophecy in Isaiah uh, that talks about it, write it on a table and note it in a book. Um, so you can look that up if you want. We won't look it up right now. But um, uh, the point is that they didn't out and out reject the 2520. What they did was they neglected it. It just sort of slipped, you know, slipped under the rug. It just got hidden away. Uh, we know that um, seven years prior, uh, the Times of the Gentiles articles written by Hiram Edson, you know, people looked at them, but there just wasn't an interest. There's no discussion that's published or or noted in any of the Adventist history about those articles, what people thought about them. Um, you know, people just didn't seem to have an interest, and he never finished the series of articles. He only did seven of them. Um, so, you know, when it comes to the 2520, what I believe is it was hidden, and it was hidden to be uncovered in our history uh, to show us that Adventism was laid on a proper foundation. And I think when it comes to uh, the work that we have to do, uh, that we're called upon, we know our message is Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. That hasn't changed. But what God has given us is, is two things by the experience that we've passed through. One is he's given us all kinds of witnesses that have resulted from the study of the 2520, but have established Adventist prophecy in, in much more detail, but also in a, on a, on a, in a way that's very hard to argue against. You can easily present these studies to people. They're very simple even though I make them complicated. They're actually very simple studies. You know, the story of Joseph. It's a story people love. And when you, when you put it on a line and you tell people this story, people are interested in it. It's not some boring story. But they see something that they've never seen before, and that's the chiasms in the story of Joseph. When you go through the story of Ezra and the journey from Babylon to Jerusalem, there's some beautiful detail in there that that has never been noted. Most Adventists just don't even know about that journey. And, but all of these things that God has showed us, the captivity, the 70 years, the 220 years where these periods of 70 years and 140 years occur, these are things that are very powerful. The first and second decree, most Adventists, they don't know that the temple was completed and dedicated um, in 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 515 bc under Darius's second the second decree under Darius in 516 bc they just don't know that um, most people believe that the temple was completed under artaxerxes decree so there's lots of these little details that when you present them to seventh-day adventists who are interested in truth that it just fits in things start to fall into place and um so I think, you know, even articles like this that have flaws, these could be things that we, we share with people um, and then show them, you know, some of the differences uh, that we have found and, and with the evidences of things that aren't noticed. But you can see how this, this even here, where they present it as if Samuel Snow, just out of nowhere, gives this midnight cry, and yet he'd already given it in Boston, and he'd already written articles on it. Now, they note that February 16th article, but they don't really give enough background. Somebody just reading this casually is not going to notice those details. Maybe even the person writing it doesn't really think about it. So, um, so we know the 2300 days, uh, they become a, a part of his argument. And it says, not until the Exeter camp meeting uh, did this prophetic chronology become prominent. James White, an eyewitness at the camp meeting, narrated how the solemn, dignified preacher, S.S. Snow, showed to the entire satisfaction of that vast body of intelligent believers the prophetic period would terminate in the fall. He told how on the next day the same speaker repeated with still greater clearness and force that the types pointed to the tenth day of the seventh month as the time for our great high priest to come out of heaven and bless his waiting people. So, I, I and I know that we've... We've referenced this before, but 
I, I do want to go through um, as we go through some of these studies in the mornings um, to, to actually bring some of these statements out and gather them together in a document similar to what we have here, but just with a bit more detail. Um, so, you know, and I think even though he places it at August 15th that he, that Bates gives him uh, the pulpit, um, you know, it, I still think that it's probably August 14th and it's the next day that the uh, presenta presentations are given uh, that uh, James White is talking about here. So I'm gonna try to, to nail some of that down um, because we've heard it, but you know, many of us couldn't find the quotes and, and prove it to somebody. So Elder Bates declared that Snow's message worked like leaven throughout the whole camp. And that meeting ended, ended the Granite Hills of um, New Hampshire were ringing with the midnight cry, behold the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And that's from Joseph Bates, Life of, Life of Joseph Bates. Uh, Though the leaders were slow to accept the message, it spread like wildfire through the ranks of the believers. The 10th day of the seventh month, the Jewish Day of Atonement, October 22, 1844, was considered to be the target date. The countdown to the advent was on. Now, um, there is an article, or not article, a book by um, F.D. Nickel um, called The Midnight Cry, which my, my wife and I read uh, back in 2018 and 19. Um, and, and that book, you know, in there, he doesn't mention the 2520 either, uh, but he does give a lot more details. Um, and, but still this, this point of Boston is not really noticed by anybody except Bates. Everybody focuses upon Exeter. And of course, Ellen White recognizes uh, the Boston one as well, saying midway. So, um, the other thing that's, that's not always clear uh, to many Adventists, and, and I've put it in papers, but when it comes to the October 22 date um, for the Jewish Day of Atonement being the 10th day of the seventh month, we, we don't really understand, or most people don't understand how the Millerites came to that date. And because they didn't fully understand the Jewish calendar, I mean, they, they, they actually had quite a few mistakes. Uh, one is they believed that they were following the Karaite calendar, which they weren't, because um, they had complete misconceptions about how the Karaite calendar worked. Um, they just believed it, the Karaites always started one month later. So, and that wasn't the case. It's very rare for them to actually start a month later uh, than the rabbis. Their main difference is that they uh, observe the month each time. So in the Karaites, they, they observe the moon every month. The Jews don't. Uh, they, they have a calculated calendar that goes 30, 29, 30, 29. And then they have some other funny rules at the end of the calendar. Um, so in, when they came up to the October 22 date, when the Millerites did, uh, they didn't use, of course, the rabbinic calculated calendar. They observed each month. And they also used the Boston sighting of the new moon not the Jerusalem sighting of the new moon. And, and there's some really interesting details, which I'd like to go into sometime. I've mentioned them. But, you know, there are people who say that it should have been October 23rd, uh, based upon the rules that we use at the time of Christ for the crucifixion. And, and now I believe it's October 22nd, but there, but there is the fact that Hiram Edson uh, when he went out into the cornfield the next morning and he saw Christ moving from the holy to the most holy place, that that would have been at evening in Jerusalem while it was morning in, in uh, New England. And if it was October 23rd, if he's actually seen Christ moving at the time he's moving, that would actually be an October 23rd, a uh, 10th day of the seventh month. So, I don't want to go into it right now, but there's interesting study in trying to understand this. And I've taken the position that even if the Millerites had the wrong date, let's say they, they somehow figure out the calendar incorrectly, God still would have honored them in how they understood it. Because one of the things that we don't, and when I say wrong, I should put it in quotation marks. Um, the Jewish calendar 
is based upon observation. And in a sense, it's by consensus. That is, people who observe a calendar uh, that's based upon the moon, you don't necessarily know whether your neighbor saw the new moon the evening before or not. And because you may not have seen it, but your neighbor might have. So you kind of talk to people and find out, you know, which date, you know, is the, which date is this today? You know, you can't just look at a calendar on the wall. And, and at different times, they follow different rules. That is convention or these unwritten rules, really, of how to observe the moon and observe the month and observe the year that aren't expl expressly uh, presented in scripture, uh, changed at different times. And so there isn't really necessarily a correct way to determine which day is the 10th day of the seventh month, even though we often think that there must be. And often the enemies of Adventism try to argue that we got it wrong, uh, but you can't really get it wrong in, in that sense, in the way that they think of it, as if there's just some fixed date that has to be, because it depends whether you see the moon or not. <laughs> and how do you know that unless you actually observe it? And, and you can't know that before it happens. So, so it's, it's an interesting study, and one day I will do a study on that uh, for people who are interested. I do have it in, in papers, but not even as detailed as I probably could have. But, you know, it's sort of an aside here that we see, um, you know, this October 22nd, 1844 date, and the Millerites took a while to figure out which date it was. So that is Samuel Snow was not the one who came up with October 22nd, 1844. He just said on the 10th day of the seventh month. He wasn't sure what day that was. He wasn't sure how to calculate that. That was other people who did that. Um, so they published the True Midnight Cry, a four-page article on August 22nd. Um, it was filled with brief but convincing arguments. His preaching of the definite time was soon taken up by hundreds of Millerite preachers. Um, while Snow himself lectured continually throughout the East, Great powers attended the cry, and eventually the ranks of believers and leaders closed together in support of the new date. Now, if you remember correctly, that there was also this idea that there was two groups. Um, uh, so you have uh, the New Hampshire and the New England groups who are actually uh, come together at the Exeter camp meeting. And it's something else I want to study into a little bit more um, about these different groups. I mean, I wish I had all the documentation and understood everything about it all, but I think some of these details are quite interesting. Um, so it says here, Snow's prophetic chronology had been correct. God had given him insight and understanding and sent through his talented, though imperfect, sent through, through this talented, though imperfect man, the message which electrified the Adventists in 1844. Today, we understand that the time setting is not wise. So this is <laughs> it's just interesting how they um, present this. And it says my internet's unstable. Hopefully, I'm uh, still connected to everyone, it looks like. Um, so it says here, uh, today that we understand the time setting is not wise. Nevertheless, Jesus said, when you see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. The signs of the times are shouting out the same electrifying message of the midnight cry, but with even greater force and urgency. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Now, this is an interesting point here. You know, so obviously he's not thinking about the context in which we're in. But we know that we, we set a date, July 18, 2020, and the event didn't come as expected. But yet, that message that God gave us is still valid and extremely powerful. So um, Ellen G. White envisioned the last days, declaring, as the third angel's message swells into a loud cry, great power and glory will attend its proclamation. And I believe that that's what we are experiencing, and, and we don't recognize it. There are many people who don't recognize that great power and glory is now occurring, and we've seen it, this wonderful manifestation of the power of God in this message. And it's going to continue to swell. Uh, may God grant his people in 1993 even greater consecration and urgency. So obviously he's done a, a very brief account of that history. 
he gets a few details wrong. Um, but, you know, it's still very powerful. I mean, when, especially for us when we read that, because we know this history much more. Now, so it's going to have this other article on the Midnight Cry, and, and so I recommend that people read these things. Now, if you're watching the video and you don't have these articles and you'd like to read them, uh, I mean, you could look them up on the internet. Um, but you can also just email email me, Theodore James Turner, all one word, at gmail.com, all lowercase. Um, and I can email you these PDFs. So, um, now this here is um, the, the seventh month. This is uh, at least part of the article that was um, uh, there. And then there's this uh, article, Samuel S. Snow, Modern Elijah. So this was um, an interesting point. So I want to look at a little bit of this. I stand before you as a monument of the grace of God, a living proof of his truths. A few years ago, I was callous and hardened and infamil, and so for years falling in with unbelievers in the Bible and very skeptics, I became impregnated with their false doctrines, and up to my 35th year, I was settled, un I was a settled unbeliever in the Bible. From 1833 uh, to 1839, I was a constant patron of the Boston Investigator. We actually read some of this in our, uh, in his, this was his personal testimony. Um, and it's interesting, some evidence exists that Snow was born in 1786. I'm not sure why there's this difference of, uh, they're not quite sure exactly when he was born. So um, so anyway, we read some of this. Um, so it's gonna talk about here on the next column, after closely studying the prophetic calculations, Snow became convinced that they were in error that the true end of time date should fall in the autumn of 1844. This he wrote at least twice to the editor of the Midnight Cry in issues of February 22nd and March 7th, 1844, carried his arguments. So I don't know about this March 7th. Um, I've never found that there's a March 7th, 1844. So Again, you know, it's probably an error because I, I remember trying to look this up before. Um, so Snow's conviction of Miller's proposed date was incorrect, was greatly augmented when the spring date event passed uneventfully. So once the first disappointment ha happened, then they were looking at this other message. And it kind of reminds me a little bit what happened with November 9th. Um, I mean, obviously we started a little bit beforehand, before November 9th disappointment, if you want to call it that. But, you know, we had, um, you know, the movement split, and then July 18th was looked at. He continued agitating the idea in his correspondence with the Midnight Cry on May 2nd, June 27th, August 22nd, and September 19th. His great breakthrough came with the camp meeting in Exeter, New Hampshire, August 15th. Snow next published his chronological conclusions in a paper called The True Midnight Cry, he was welcomed at other camp meetings. His message that Jesus would come on October 22nd, 1844, with its application to the ten foolish virgins, and its cry, Behold the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him, stirred the Adventist believers to action. Uh, nevertheless, this date also passed. The event the Millerites so fervently awaited once again failed to occur. For a brief time after the disappointment, Snow questioned, as to whether a mistake had been made in the prophetic reckoning of the year and search for another time or event. He rejected the message of Hiram, message Hiram Edson had um, received, that the date had indeed been correct and that Jesus had entered the most holy place and had a work to do before he would return to the earth. He continued searching for a definite time for Christ's return. He preached it would be October 22 of 1845. 1846 or 1847, and this caused sharp conflicts to develop between him and the Millerites, who had decided against further date setting. Finally, he moved to New York in January of 1845, where he had been invited to pastor the Franklin Hall congregation. The story is told that the people of Worcester wanted Snow to be their pastor, who would not let him 
unless he confessed that their time setting was wrong. And he would not relinquish this belief and decided to go to New York. So without enough money to get to New York, he left his wife and four children and headed south. He stopped at Hartford and gave only three lectures because he caught cold. And they gave him six dollars with which he proceeded to New York. Once there, he was invited uh, to pastor the Franklin Hall congregation and only accepted on the condition that they move his family to New York. And they arrived January 10th, 1845. Snow next adopted the shut door theory from Joseph Turner, which in essence taught that the date was correct, but the event in error. And the bridegroom came spiritually and shut the door to his house. And therefore only those who entered on the 22nd of October were saved. All other sinners were condemned. Because of adopting this idea, he was dismissed from the Franklin Hall Church in February 1845 after his last sermon on the 27th. With a group of members who agreed with him, he established a new group in March 1845 called the Mount Zion Church. And he began publishing a paper entitled The Jubilee Standard and to, set, to disseminate the shut door theory, but it continued only sporadically for 21 issues from March to August 1845. Um, it says, he went so far as to say, with those who do not believe great and glorious truth, we have nothing to do. Their doom is sealed and is, it is just. They have likewise rejected the world's last warning, the true midnight cry, and God has rejected them. So, um, it, you know, it's very interesting when we look at the parallel there um, regarding these things. And it, it's interesting here, you know, it goes through some of his history. Uh, he preached his last sermon on Sunday, July 13th, 1870, at the Mount Zion Church. He died at the age of 84, according to his funeral service. Snow thinking, Snow's thinking had become twisted. He had continued to believing himself to be Elijah until the day he died. Now, um, so I'm, I'm not, they don't give the exact date that he died here, um, but obviously it was shortly after he did that sermon. So probably a few days after, maybe that day or the next day, I don't know. Um, so yeah, so by eight, May of 1845 is when he became to believe that he was, um, you know, Elijah. And, you know, there's, so there's, you know, a number, of, and it's the book, The Overflowing Scourge, um, which was published May 21st, 1848, page four. Um, that, that's the book that I was talking about earlier. So now does uh, Kelly's there? I see Kelly's online. How long have you been listening, Kelly? I just, uh, just switched back. Now I got I called uh, Ron to get him to tune in too. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, there, there's definitely a lot of a lot of things that we haven't studied, as much as we, you know, we think we understand Millerite history, I think that we don't. Um, I mean, God has obviously revealed these waymarks for us from Millerite history. Uh, it comes with the, the unsealing of uh, the seven thunders of this experience we passed through. But, um, you know, as I start to look at this, there's things that, I, I, you know, I've read a lot of this, but I, I think there's details that we miss. We just don't see things because we're not looking for them. Now, uh, there's just this other document I gave you called Samuel Snow Review. It's going to give highlights of his life. And so they have 1806 is his birth date, uh, that he was born in 1806, 1839. He read this book by Miller. So there's obviously discrepancies about when he was born. Um, and uh, so it just has some of this information that we talked about, but just in, in a cursory way. So when they mention here the true midnight cry sections, I got to blow this up so you can see it. Um, and you know, again, here's what he presents: the six thousand years. Now they have the seven times of the Gentiles. So um, so he has adjusted uh, Usher's chronology. And they have the seven times of the Gentiles here. So, you know, people know about it. I'm not sure who put this together, 
Um, so maybe this was somebody who believed in the 2520, but we can see that most of the times that people actually miss this. Um, and then the 2300 days, of course, the seven weeks and the types. And, and the idea of the types, the spring and fall types, we still understand as Adventists. Um, so it's something that, that William Miller had introduced, um, but Snow elaborates on it. Uh, so Miller had just introduced it in regard to the fall, but Snow kind of takes that detail and expands it. So this has just a lot of that background that's, that's in those, uh, those papers. And then we have this other document um, this one is uh, his book from 1863. You can see uh, that's what he looks like, and he's a bit older. Samuel Snow, and uh, this book is the Voice of Elias or Prophecy Restored. And you know it's interesting going through this because a lot of it. Is very familiar to Adventists. He's going to go through much of this, this history. Now, notice the date again, 1863, that this is published. So we see basically uh, this counterfeit movement that, of course, uh, fails. It comes out of the, the Millerite movement. And, you know, it always should be a warning to us. I mean, I've, I've mentioned this before, that, you know, what happened to Samuel Snow, we have to be careful that that type of thing doesn't happen to us that we don't go into fanaticism. And when people claim to be Samuel Snow, they're actually uh, making a decision, which I think, or you know, something that they think is desirable, which I think is not really desirable. Uh, Samuel Snow uh, definitely did not uh, continue on uh, in the light. He went into a darkness, even though much of what he presents is, is truth. It's still mixed with error. And Ron, good evening. So Ron's pretty much missed, missed all of this, but he can, he can watch it later. Um, so in what, what I just did now is I reviewed some documents that, uh, that I had. I'm still trying to look for this book called The Overflowing Scourge, um, which was written in 1848. And... And in this book, I believe it's the book that I have on one of my computers, that um, Samuel Snow actually has a lot of this correspondence that he had uh, with others. And uh, so I, you know, I can't find it on the internet now. I'm not sure why. But anyway, that book, I, I want to get it to everyone. Because you can see his character of the way that he deceives himself and the way that he's dishonest. Um, it reminds me of, uh, you know, what we saw happening with um, the new movement. And, and so, you know, you always wonder, you know, how does God use someone? Uh, or how does God use, I mean, obviously that, you know, people come in and, and they come in with this message that is a true message, but there's some fault with that person. And, you know, now, no, we all have faults, but the question is there's a, a deadly fault, a fault that leads them into fanaticism, into apostasy in some way. And, you know, I, I've always wondered about that. I know there are people who just say, uh, you know, once somebody has presented something true and they've gone into apostasy, then obviously what they presented wasn't true. But you could do look at Jones and Wagner. I mean, the message they gave was from God, but both of them went into apostasy in different ways. Um, Wagner got into pantheism and, uh, um, you know, had all kinds of excuses. He lived in sin. Um, and he eventually had rejected the whole sanctuary message. Uh, Jones kind of went a little bit more the other direction, uh, in, in some of his extremism. Uh, but mostly he was opposed to, uh, basically, uh, what the, the leadership of the church more than anything. He still believed um, in Adventism, even though he was in, in opposition to the church and over personal reasons. So, you know, to decide whether something is true or not, I mean, we know obviously God uses people who vary in temperament and vary in uh, 
in different ways, it's hard to accept that God uses people who eventually go into apostasy. Uh, it's a hard thing to accept. Um, but, you know, it happens. So, you know, to follow man is not a wise thing. And God's definitely calling us to, to study for ourselves. So um, I know, as always, I feel like I'm rambling on. I'm not getting a lot of feedback here. But um, I'm going to ask some questions, and I'm going to need people to give some answers. So how are people, um, I can even just name you, but how are people feeling, you know, now that we're uh, a few weeks past July 18th, 2020, from a point, um, and, and you don't necessarily have to answer if you don't want to, but... Um, can you see God's leading of what has happened in what has happened? So I'm going to ask you this. I mean, I know some of you what you think, but I just want you to express it of, of how you, you sort of see this point. So don't all talk at once. I'll just say I definitely um, see God's hand in everything that's happened. And we kind of know that what happened, you know, could likely have happened because if you follow the Millerites history, you can see, you know, what, um, what they were dealing with. So definitely I think God's going to give more clear light on it. Yeah, is there any specific I, things that you see happening in your life or around you that has shown you this, or scriptures even that, that have come to your mind or, or impressed you? Not so much. Just um, I, I studied my history quite a bit because I presented it to my church and my um my prayer meeting group. So just just from that is is what is helping me, I think. So presenting things to people helps. Well, from before. Oh, from before, even just from, from before. Years, from years back, you know, knowing knowing the right history, um, knowing what they went through. It always was in the back of my mind that we're going to have disappointments. You know, we're going to have um, things that happen that aren't clear. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for that. Um, anyone else? We don't have a lot of people here, so it's an opportunity to say something. Theodore, I feel like uh, yeah. it absolutely caused me to wake up when I first uh, seen the part about being settled in Nashville. I think it was February 6th or 7th. Okay. I had not been following uh, for quite some time just due to the life and something just impressed me that day to go back and look up uh, FFA because I really enjoyed that before. And uh, I can tell you it's, it hadn't been the same since. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, even when we got past July 18th, uh, and obviously the chronological stuff was hard for me to understand. Mm -hmm. But after that, uh, this past month, many, many times you have discussed being humble. You've discussed your personal experience, even outside of, uh, chronology. And mm -hmm. those things in and of itself has helped me greatly and even helped me express in my own mind things that I had thought about my Adventist walk and uh, I'm looking at it as a positive and mm -hmm. um, I'm very grateful for it. Yeah. Well, you, you express, you know, things that, uh, that definitely I feel, um, you know, that it is a positive. It, it, it puzzles me when people say that it's, it's a negative um, because I just see, I just see so much evidence that God has, has been behind this, but also it's just, it's since July 18th, really things have expanded. I mean, our understanding of Millerite history has really expanded 
because one is we, we can now identify with it, but also just what we've been studying, we can, we, I have a much different view of Millerite history than I had before July 18th, believe it or not. It, it just, to me, there's just, it's, it's, it's come alive um, for me. So uh, Kelly or Ron and, and Chuck's there too. And anybody have any thoughts on this? We're just asking people to give their testimonies regarding uh, how they've experienced, uh, what they've experienced as far as July 18th, uh, the disappointment and how it is, um, affected them and how they're feeling uh, a few weeks on. So I don't know how closely Kelly's listening. Not, not well. I'm busy trying to get out of the city here, yeah. heading north. Yeah. I've got a few things i got to do. Okay. okay. So Ron, do you have any thoughts? Any, I know you missed a bit of our studies. So I don't know if Ron's listening carefully or not. He's on there. And Chuck, do you have anything to say? <laughs> uh, I've, I've usually got plenty to say. Uh, I am uh, convinced that this went the way that the Lord wanted it to go. Yeah. Uh, I probably have been more vocal about everything I believe, uh, both on my, my site yeah. and on my comments. Yeah. The, uh, I don't back away from anything that I've said. No. Uh, the, what, what we've been given, uh, has been, uh, through the footsteps of Christ and through his word. And, uh, I can't deny that. Yeah. Uh, he's asked me to defend this and uh, I will do so. Uh, I'll continue to, def to defend his walls. And uh, oftentimes I find myself on the outside looking in. Yeah. Uh, which is okay with me. I think that's where he wants me to be. Uh, we're all, and the the numbers in our morning meetings are like six, uh, plus a church. <laughs> Angela's always there. Uh, the I've seen that number mentioned in Ezekiel uh, post July 18, and uh, it's a small number. It's a remnant of what we've got. Uh, there's a lot going on. Uh, in Arkansas that's not uh, has not come into the open yet I don't believe well yeah we, uh, we don't really know what's going on I don't like to speculate about things I mean obviously I believe that <laughs> um, you know one of the things that, that has to happen uh, just is that in order to pull together one thing we can't do is speculate about what's happening but God is God is not asking us to look to some person you know, to look to Jeff or, or whatever, uh, because right now we have to sort things out ourselves. There's nothing wrong with us sharing what we learn, but, you know, my big burden is, you know, because I've thought about, like, I have a lot of people watching my videos. Um, but the thing I don't want to do is to, you know, sort of, because uh, there was this suggestion, you know, that maybe I'm picking up the pieces of, of FFA, which I, I don't really uh, believe. I mean, I, I believe I'm trying to help people, but what we have to do is we as individuals, instead of just, you know, coming together and following some leader again, that this movement has to expand out. And, um, you know, similar, I guess, to when uh, the persecution began uh, in 34 AD and, and the gospel began to go to the Gentiles, you know, we see, and not just 34 AD, but later, uh, we see that, you know, the gospel had to get out and people were insular. And, and so we need to have ministries, all of us, uh, that are ministering. And those ministries don't need to be big, right? To get an, a, a big job done, 
with if everybody does their little bit of the wall, if they're building that wall of, of Jerusalem and everybody just does their part, the job can get done. But if everybody's looking for somebody to do it, it's not going to get done. And so God has given us all a field to work, and that's what we have to do. So um, I just want to review. I'm going to draw on the whiteboard here. One of the, the I just want to say, yeah, um, Theodore, like I, I saw somebody, I think it was on the chats, they said, like, it had to happen this way, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and maybe because we believe it, maybe it did help. Um, they, I said one family, I think, um, at least one, was moving out of Nashville. And, and that's kind of the whole thing that, that God, you know, is warning people so that they will believe and get out. So to me, it was worth it for, for just that. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously for that part is, is important. I mean, warning Nashville was important. I mean, obviously, we, we wouldn't have been doing our duty if we hadn't. Um, but, you know, the other, the other part of it, I mean, there's the people that are warned, but it's more about us and the work that we're, we're going to do. Now, um, in, in going through this study, we went through the study of the disappointments this week. And, you know, it becomes really clear that we can see a parallel with October 22nd and July 18th, right? So this is, as we go through the disappointments of the Millerites, we can see that they had many disappointments and we also have had disappointments in our history. And in, in Millerite history, uh, we saw that July, or not July, August 11th, 1840, they believed was going to be a shut door and that the seventh trumpet would begin to sound and the third woe would begin. And so they expected a lot of things to happen before October 22nd, but, or before Jesus comes back. But as they approached October 22nd, they actually changed their views because they couldn't have all those events happen. If Jesus was coming back, none of the events that they had actually prophesied occurred. And, and we can see that parallel with, with our dates. You know, if you're going to put this is, you know, sort of a simplification. But if you put April 19th, 1844 here, um, you can line this up. Not that this is the best way to do it, but at least as far as a disappointment, you could line this up with November 9th, 2019, and July 18th, 2020 over here. You know, if you're going to, and, and people have done that before. But, but some people always ask about this one. Well, this is September 11th you know, 2001, 9-11, and, and this is really what we line up with August 11th, 1840. Now, you know, in doing this as, as far as, as this is concerned, one of the confusions about it is this is the, in the line of the priests. And really, this is a fractal. You know, we've, we've always placed these things in this way. We look at the line of the priests as this big line. But we've experienced something that if we're going to put it into Millerite history, happens from here to here. Uh, basically, July 18th, 1844, Samuel Snow's letters. And Samuel Snow is beginning his work here. Uh, however you want to look at when his work begins, it's after August 11th. And Samuel Snow is typifying this movement. So if you're going to look at at this history here, whatever this history is, whenever you're going to start it, you can see that in our history, we have a movement that has happened and, and it culminates, the priests culminate here in this, in this big line. But in reality, our movement is shrunk over from this big line because this parallels a line that we haven't actually entered. So, so if we're going to look at, you know, we got midnight and the midnight cry. So you got July 21st and August 15th. We had been predicting, you know, that Raphia and Paneum would be on November 9th and July 18th. Right? That was the initial idea of those two dates. And yet 
we know that none of what we expected about Rafi and Paneum really happened. And so we can look at this as a failure. But if we understand that we're the line of the priests, we're actually snow here. And all of snow stuff happens before Raphia. So snow's line in which he parallels us, and he's also Ezekiel, and he's also this movement, the priests. Our movement could not, even though, you know, I say we line this up here. Now, this is July 18th, 1844. But July 18th, 1844, as far as the line of the priest is concerned, lines up with July 18th. 2020. And I don't know if I made that clear in the presentation, but when we look at the line of the priests, these two things, Samuel Snow's last letter and our prediction, this was the prediction before midnight. You know, you start with, you're going to start here at February 16th with his first letter. This is a progression. And, and this progression, this history here actually lines up with our history. And, and I'm going to go through that next week in the morning classes, I'm going to go through um, all of the major lines. So I'm not going to get to this until the end, until probably Thursday. Um, so I'm going to be basically doing a condensation, uh, a condensed presentation of what I had been presenting for a few months. But I'm going to focus upon the chiasms. And, and so we're going to see that the chiasms and how we can relate them to each other. These are the, the things that are extremely powerful uh, to present to Seventh-day Adventists. And, and that's really what I want to focus on as I'm, as I'm going to move ahead in the studies. I really want to focus on the messages that we have to give to Seventh-day Adventists. You know, and, and sometimes we think, you know, well, you know, and I've thought about having a website and, and all these types of things. And, and as I continue to consider these things, I'm realizing that what we need to do as individuals is understand these things and present them. Because if all you're doing is directing people to a website or directing people to somebody else's videos, you're not learning anything because you're not going to learn unless you present and you have to present what you know. And when you do that, you will find that you will, you will study more, you'll understand more, You'll have be answering people's questions and, and, and you will be, you will be empowered uh, to give a message. God has lifted up his people as an enzyme, I believe. And we can't get distracted by other issues because there's a lot of other issues out there that we think are the message, you know, vaccination conspiracy theories and, and, and all these other things that, that are happening in the world. Uh, these are distractions from the message that God has given us to give. And, and, and we need to start presenting these simple Bible truths to people. And if, and if God has humbled us, which I believe he has, people will be willing to listen. If we, if we are changed by what has happened to us, people will be willing to listen. And people are willing to listen. And so this is kind of what I'm wanting to, you know, to do next week is at least start on that, go over the chiasms for us to kind of get them in our minds um, and how they're all connected. And I'm not sure what's going to happen the week after that, but I know that that's what we need to do next week for ourselves. And we're going to have to study these things out. We're going to have to know them. And, and in a simple way, I'm not talking about all the details that I present all the time. I'm talking about in a simple way uh, to look at these things and how to present them from the scriptures. And, you know, obviously I'm going to still probably be doing some presentations on some details that people have questions about, because sometimes if you don't have certain details and somebody asks you a question, you need to know the answer to that. But when it comes to an actual presentation, you can't do things as detailed as I do. That doesn't make sense. Um, I'm doing them for a video, and it's a different purpose. But when I'm sharing with people one-on-one, -on -one, I know which details I can leave out based on who that person is and which details I have to share. So it's a little bit different doing a video than presenting to individuals. So any, any final questions? We're not going to have a much longer study here, unless some people have some things they want to share 
or questions they need answered. So, have you looked at uh, Ezekiel twenty forty five? Yeah, in the uh, in the study Bible, uh, Sister White labels it the fire in the southern forest. Okay, and. I know you're figured you're, you're, you're a metaphor guy and all these metaphors make sense to you, but they don't make sense to me. Um, yeah. The forest of the South field. Now, are you aware what happened in Oklahoma? When? August the 4th. Uh, uh, no, not August the 4th. That was, uh, that was uh, Beirut. That was Beirut. You're talking uh, about the windstorm. Uh, no. I'm talking about the the state Supreme Court decision to give oh, okay. the land back to the uh, Cherokee tribes and the Muskegee Indians, okay. all of eastern Oklahoma. And that's moved to the Supreme Court. And according to uh, Ezekiel 2045, that fire is going to run north through every Indian land that's been taken away from them by the United States. See, the thing, Chuck, is I don't see how you make these connections. There just doesn't seem to be any way that I could make that leap, you know, that you're making, you know. Okay. You know, I understand what I'm saying, right? Like, to me, it's not methodical. You're not methodical. You don't have, you know, line upon line. You just look at a verse and you see something happening, and then you jump to these. Well, this isn't the only verse I've been looking at. But I know, it's, it's, but I'm just saying almost every verse that you've ever showed me, I don't see what you see in these verses. So I'm not sure why. But, uh, you know, maybe maybe somehow you see things that are, are correct, and I, I just can't see them. That's always possible. I'm not saying that you're wrong. I'm just saying I can't make those connections, right? Um, How about the 45? Yeah, well, what is that? During the reign of Trump. Yeah, I know. So every verse that has 45, the word of Jehovah came unto me saying. So in, you know, that doesn't tell me anything looking at that verse. You know, that happens lots of times in the Bible, especially in, in Ezekiel. And it happens to happen in Ezekiel 20 and verse 45. You know, maybe it has some application, but I'm just saying the way that you make an application, it seems to me just to be out in the left field. You know, it doesn't, um, there's lots of different ways in which you could interpret this passage, even if you were going to apply it now, that would have nothing to do with what you said, right? That's all I'm saying. It, it just seems to me. Okay, we'll see where, where it goes. <laughs> okay. Well, so far, I haven't seen anything that you said where we'll see where it goes ever went where, where, where you thought it was going to go. So that would be the other difficulty there. But... Um, and also, I do believe in the movement together, seeing things. Um, I don't believe that there's just, you know, somebody with uh, an idea. Because, you know, even with July 18th, that was this movement. I mean, as much as I found some of the stuff initially that wasn't promoted by me, it was promoted by FFA. If it had just been promoted by me, it wouldn't have gone anywhere. So, you know, God has to be behind it as well. Um, so I'm not trying to be hard on you, Chuck. I'm just trying to be honest. And hopefully, you know, they're different. Uh, Kevin, you have yeah, a thought? I, I see that um, our history lines up with snow, and I know that we have said we are snow. Mm -hmm. uh, that last letter on July 18th of 44, is there anything that correlates with July 18th uh, in particular that has jumped out at you? Well, the, the, the letter, the article's entitled Confirming the Covenant. Um, and the thing about that, that article is, um, I'm just going to go to it here in Three Angels Messages source book. And I'll bring it up. Because, you know, when, when I originally studied this, of course, this was back in 2017, and I, I couldn't really look at this history and understand what was being said. That is, 
Um, okay, that's Midnight Cry, June 24th, July 18th, confirming the covenant. Now, his focus here is the midst of the week. And, and what I was doing in 2017, and then in 2018, so this is not necessarily everybody's familiar with this, um, but in 2017, of course, I presented Samuel Snow's letters. And I was, you know, looking at this confirming the covenant, trying to understand what it was about. And what I noticed is that Samuel Snow had become fixated with the midst of the week. And one of the things I know is that when there is a precious truth, that often somebody will come along with fanatical views that actually um, cause people not to look into something. And, and definitely this was an issue that Snow had, but we know it was a precious truth but he took it in a different direction. But so he confirms the covenant with many for one week and in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And my study from 2017 to when I presented July 18, 2020 was all about the midst of the week. It was the 10th day of the fifth month because when you study that passage in Daniel chapter nine and you deal with verses 25 and 26, you're dealing with this uh, and 27, you know, 24 to 27, but you're dealing with, there's these two parallel passages. Um, and I know I've presented this, but if you go to chapter nine and in verse 26 and 27, it says after 62 weeks, or, or actually we would start, um, yeah, 26. And after 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. So this is talking about that final week. And then it talks about the destruction of Jerusalem. Then shall, uh, then the people of the ruler who shall come, I'm not on the King James here, where I'm making it go here. I was, I was looking at this, it didn't really make much sense. Um, After three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So this talks about the destruction of Jerusalem on the 10th day of the fifth month. And then he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it, that's the city, desolate, even unto the end. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So here in verse 26 and 27, you have uh, the week is mentioned, and then the destruction of Jerusalem. The week is mentioned again, and then the destruction of Jerusalem. So in 2018, at the camp meeting, I presented the literal week of Christ, you know, the day that he was baptized all the way to the stoning of Stephen and put it in actual dates on our calendar. And one of the things that came from that is that that confirmed that structure of that week was that the date of the 10th day of the fifth month lined up with 70 AD on the dates on the bottom. So unless you know the study, you have no idea what I'm talking about. But it was that 10th day of the seventh month that I found in the midst of the week was that I used in Samuel Snow's letters, um, the July 18th date, and that we found the structure of Samuel Snow's letters when I did this. So I'm just going to uh, draw this here. So this is like a huge study, which I'm going to try to to draw, but um, without going into the details. But just the, the profoundness of this of the confirming the covenant is about July 18th in our history. So to answer your question, um, but it comes from understanding this structure of our history. So we had these dates, June 9th, 2018, uh, the camp meeting in Italy, the prayer at 9 11 PM by Jeff. And then the prediction of, of Daniel on July 27th, um, that on October 13th, the midnight cry would be given at Lambert Church. And, and then we know that um, I was at Lambert Church at noon and I did this calculation to uh, November 9th. Twenty nineteen of three hundred ninety one and a half days. And so this, this was confirming this date. 
Um, but then from that, we saw that the center of this was August 11th and that there was 63 days on each side. But I had also marked 120 days, so this is 126 days, uh, to June 15th. So just here, I'll put it underneath. Um, so there's six days here. So this 63 goes right from there to there, there to there. And then obviously you got August 11th, Julian. And, it, and then what I had done when I'd found this July 18th date based on Ezekiel on the 10th day of the fifth month. Um, well, actually, I need to leave that here. Sorry about that. So, um, so it's 391.5 days. So I found this date here, uh, July 18th, 2020, Julian, but it doesn't really matter because all I did is I counted back 391 days and I came to Samuel Snow's third letter, the June 22nd letter. So that was the same period of time. So that's just adding an extra year in Samuel Snow's letters. So it wasn't so much about what these dates are. It's just that we found that we could line up all of Samuel Snow's letters. This one lined up with his May 2nd letter. This one lines up with April 19th. Uh, this one lines up with April 3rd when his first letter is republished in the signs. This lines up with February 22nd, the date that his, his letter was first published in The Midnight Cry, and this lines up here. So the spaces and the spans are the same. Um, and so we saw that this July 18th prediction gave us the structure of Samuel Snow's letters with another chiasm that we hadn't noticed, which was these two periods of 63 days um, in 1844. So we had Samuel Snow's other chiasm with May 2nd as the center, but we now have this other chiasm. And this was the profound thing. So if you think about this, this is confirming the covenant. This July 18th date is exactly uh, what uh, Samuel Snow's July 18th letter was, but it also gives us this structure of our history, which is this is part of the midnight chiasm. So the midnight chiasm, we know we end up with the September 6th date or September 7th date here and uh, the January uh, 11th date in 2020 and you know we could you know this chiasm has the center of March 27th and there's all kinds of stuff here anyway the point is I know I confused everybody if you don't know what this is about but the point is that this structure of Samuel Snow's letters this was presented before we had uh, Ezekiel's prophecy to give us July 18 2020 that was the next week that I found that so I just had this Julian date which ended up being the 10th day of the fifth month in so that was from the destruction of Jerusalem so you can see that this is connected to the destruction of Jerusalem and it's connected in Samuel Snow's July 18th letter that's the profound thing so I should actually put this as you know 1844 if you're going to have it in with the letters but anyway so I know that was a little bit confusing and but that was a really good question and that's one of the things I want to expand upon um, it, when we look at uh, these chiasms and these structures, without confusing everybody, hopefully. Um, so, hopefully, you, you probably didn't expect such a long answer, but does that answer your question? <laughs> yes, it does. When you drew that um, uh, diagram with those two parallels, for some reason, it just jumped out at me more yeah. than it has in the past. I don't know why. And uh, that's, that's exciting. Yeah. And, and, and so what it shows is that God, like that's the thing that I see is that God was trying to show us something that we weren't wanting to see or we weren't ready to see. And, and so I believe that God has confirmed the covenant at what we have experienced in this experience. This disappointment is a taste of something, uh, something of the cross. And, um, but it's in a very profound way. So when you look at his arguments that he goes into about confirming the covenant, he doesn't really understand what he's talking about. That, that's the thing that I find is that um, 
You know, he believes that he's going in a direction, but that direction he ends up going in is the wrong direction. But the letter itself and the topic of the letter and the connection he makes between the week of Christ and this confirming of the covenant, we experience in our history. So um, anyway, we're going to close with prayer. And thank you for that, that question. So let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, I thank you for the Sabbath that's coming here. Maybe other people are experiencing it already. Um, but we ask, Lord, that this experience of Christ in the midst of the week can become real to us in our lives. We know, Lord, that there is an experience um, that we are going to have that, um, that human nature shrinks from. Many times we've talked about, you know, this vision of Christ, this uh, revelation of Christ, um, the Mara experience and all these different things that people have talked about. But we've talked about it as little children who, who talk foolishly and don't know what they're speaking of. We know, Lord, that the experience that we go through is not a pleasant one. And, um, and you are giving us uh, light that will help us as we move forward in this time versus history. Help us to study faithfully, be with each person uh, who's, who's studying these things. Anybody watching this video, we ask for your angels to be around them, your Holy Spirit to guide them. And uh, we ask, Lord, that this Sabbath would truly be a blessing and that we can be a blessing to others. Thank you for hearing our prayer. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So thanks, everyone. A little bit smaller uh, group today, but that's fine. Um, and uh, appreciate each person's uh, comments and participation. And... Uh, so I'm going to say goodbye. My wife and I are going to go for a walk before Sabbath. And uh, so I'm just going to stop the recording here. <laughs>